morning. morning. Just to do a little plug here, I'm taking after the uh, footsteps of Brother Randy here, and I've published a book. It's, uh, I would have brought a copy for you guys all to have, but uh, it's still being shipped. But it's on the topic of uh, relationship or friendship with God. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today, too. Uh, if you would open up to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and the first uh, uh, six or seven verses there. And uh, before we get any further, I'd like to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. <coughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for this time for fellowship, time to look into your word. And we just ask your blessing on this time that you speak to our hearts and share with us truths that you want us to receive. We just lift this before you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, for uh, probably 35 years or so, I've been doing a study on uh, the friendship with God, the relationship with God, and that's kind of what prompted the, this, this book. And uh, you'll even see, if, if you look into the book, you'll see that when I first started uh, my journey with trying to find a relationship with the, with the young lady, um, I constantly got rejected. Um, I don't know if you had that same experience as, as me, but I always got the, the worst uh, comment was, you're a nice guy, but. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm always like, well, don't you want a nice guy? But, but you know, through that process, um, I started thinking, you know, I'm trying to seek a relationship with other people, and I'm being rejected. What about my relationship with God? Mm. And do I reject Him, or do I accept Him? How does He feel? And so that prompted the, the, the study on uh, fellowship with God, a relationship with Him. And if you would read with me uh, 1 John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and with, was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. First John, uh, or in the book, uh, Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, we see where Christ prayed in the garden with the Heavenly Father. Here's a little glimpse about the relationship that Jesus has with his Father. John 17 is not just the, the sample prayer that often you hear people praying, you know, our Father which art in heaven, but it's an actual prayer that Jesus Christ prayed. And uh, we see that uh, actually in Matthew 6 where the Lord's Prayer sh is shared to teach us how to pray. But John 17, again, as I mentioned, is the actual prayer that Christ gave. And he, and he did this because of his relationship with the Heavenly Father. First John talks about having that relationship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And as we see in verse 3, again, it says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. <coughs> How can we fellowship with Him if our relationship is not right? As we look through uh, this book in 1 John, we see that we can have fellowship not only with God, but also with one another. Verse 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 7 tells us that we may have fellowship one with another, and that's what we're doing today. Point one I want to share today is the beginning. The beginning. Let's look back again at verse 1. Let's start back at the beginning. Have you ever read a story or watched a, a show or a movie and the plot starts in the middle of the story. 
then they jump back to the beginning, and they roll on, and they catch back up to where the movie started. John doesn't do that here. He starts straight at the beginning. The beginning of Christ's ministry here on earth. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our eyes have handled, the word of life. That which was from the beginning. What is the beginning? The scriptures are referring, um, the gospel of Mark starts out stating in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the beginning of 1 John 1, 1 that it's referring to. In fact, uh, John MacArthur states that although John's gospel uses a similar phrase meaning eternity past, John 1, 1 in the beginning, the phrase here in context with verses 1 through 4 refers to the beginning of the gospel preaching when the readers first heard about Jesus. Point two is the human sense. The human sense. There are five senses that... Uh, God is designed within our body, sight, sound, touch, taste, smell. Here John talks about three of those senses. Verse 1 again, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now I enjoy history, all kinds of history. I like history about the family, how to, you know, art ancestors get here and uh, his, history about church history about their nation all various types of history and during my time in the military I attended a, a various training in, in the courses which which they had for uh, for my career field and one of them they had a gentleman there uh, he was an actual living Tuskegee Airman uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Now he's since passed away. You know, this was like about 20, 25 years ago. But as he spoke, he shared his firsthand experiences about being a colored individual in the military, the various types of jobs that they had, that they accomplished, that they struggled with, that they faced because of their race and their color. Per Wikipedia, <coughs> on the Tuskegee Airmen, it says that the Tuskegee Airmen is the popular name of a group of African-American military pilots, fighter and bomber, who fought in World War II. Finally, they formed the 332nd Fighter Group and the 477th Bombardment Group of the United States Army Air Forces. The name also applies to the, the navigators, bombardiers, mechanics, instructors, crew chiefs, nurses, cooks, and other support personnel for their pilots. The Tuskegee Airmen was the first African-American military aviators in the United States Armed Forces during World War II. As this veteran shared his stories and his, his experiences, I could almost envision firsthand what life was like nearly the 1900s, mm -hmm. the early 1900s. We could see the surrounding activities that he spoke about is, as he allowed our, our mind's eye to capture <coughs> the presentation. Why was it so important for us to hear from this man? Why didn't the instructor just let us read about it in our textbooks? Because hearing true events from someone who actually lived it firsthand mm -hmm. makes the event not only come to life, but it means more to us. We're able to experience secondhand through the words that someone shared who actually lived it firsthand. And that's what the Apostle Paul, or I'm sorry, Apostle John is doing here when he writes 1 John. By the time John is writing the three epistles, roughly 60 years has passed since the time that Christ lived and walked on the earth. And this epistle was written sometime around 90 to 95 AD, somewhere in that, that time frame. And, John saw Christ firsthand. He spoke with him. He touched him. He knew him. And he learned from him. And here we see John sharing this opening statement. Again, John continues in 1 1 using three of the five human senses hearing, seeing, and touching. Just for your information, for those in this world 
who think science has nothing to do with the scriptures, this verse shares a very scientific approach. Science is learned through the senses, taste, touch, smell, so forth, and here we see this in action. We have heard, John writes how Christ was heard as he spoke. We have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon, many people were able to see and gaze upon Jesus during his earthly ministry, especially those whose eyesights were healed by Christ himself. Our hands have handled. Many believe in Jesus. They've heard about his death. But what happened after he died? As we know from scriptures, Christ did not remain dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 shares how Christ died for our sins, how he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And here John is revealing the reality of a living Savior. A ghost or a spirit could not be heard could not be gazed at for long periods of time, but that is looked upon or be touched and handled. Christ revealed his resurrected body to his disciples. He even walked among the earth and he ministered before his ascension. Mark 16 shares some of this before he gave the great commission. The great commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. Christ was not dead. He was not a ghost. He was alive. He is alive today. John chapter 20 verses 26 through 29 shares where the disciples, the disciple Thomas, doubting Thomas, he did not believe that Christ rose up from the grave, that he was alive. And this is where we get the phrase doubting Thomas. Christ told Thomas to touch him, to feel his wounds from the cross. Christ indeed rose again the third day, and John wants his readers to know this truth. And the third point is the living word. The living word. <coughs> Verse 1 concludes by stating the word of life. The New King James actually expresses it this way, concerning the word of life. The dictionary definition of concern means relating to, to be connected with, to be of interest or of importance to. The Word of God relates to everything that John has shared in the few but vital words in the first verse. Notice the way the Word is written in, in, in the Bible. It starts out with a capital W. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, John 1.1. 1, 1. And this style of spelling indicates that this is Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Greek, Greek word used here is logos, and this is the exact same word used in the Gospel of John, John 1. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things that were made through Him and without and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. If you continue down to verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Christ is the word. The Son of God came to earth, taking on the form of man, the very form of man who he created, as we see in Genesis 2, verse 7. He joined with his creation, becoming part of it so that he could save it. To recap, first we have the beginning of Christ's ministry, where Christ ministered to the world and, and, and taught his disciples. During this time, we see Christ giving us not only teaching and instruction, but also example through his own life, on how we ought to live. Secondly, we see the physical reality of Christ. He lived and walked up among us nearly 2,000 years ago. He died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And because of that, the debt of sin has been paid so that we may have eternal life, be able to fellowship with him, with the Father the Son, and the Son, Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we see that Jesus is the living Word. 
He was in the beginning when this world was made. He became flesh and dwelt among us, as mentioned in the second point. And Christ's ministry did not end when he died. <coughs> it didn't end when he ascended to heaven. He taught his disciples and he instructed them to continue on with the work, sharing and teaching and preaching the gospel. The commission did not stop when the disciples died. They in turn passed the torch to those around them who listened as they were instructed under their teaching and then that torch had been passed on from generation to generation to where we are today. And part of that responsibility includes having a rela relationship with the, with the Father to be able to fellowship with, with the one who created us. And that's why First John, that, that's what First John is, is about. Showing us the importance <coughs> and the value of a relationship with the Heavenly Father. With Jesus Christ as well and, and that's a work that has and that's a work that has uh, begun in each one of us the moment that we accepted and received God's gift of salvation is eternal life through Jesus Christ and in closing I just want to share Ephesians 6 10 says finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and as we fellowship with the Lord we find strength through the word of God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, thank you for your word, for the fellowship that we can have with each other here, more importantly, with the fellowship that we can have with you. And Father, the greatest thing of knowing that our fellowship doesn't end the moment we die, but it actually just begins. This is life eternal that we may know you, and for all of eternity, we will get to know you more and more and more. And Father, I just pray that as we have the opportunity now that we just continue to seek that relationship, to have that fellowship with you, and to grow stronger in your word and in your truth. I lift these words before you, and I ask your blessings on each one here. In Jesus' name, amen.